Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. Well, hello and welcome to this week's Countryside with Kiri Kermode and Simon Clark. And, well, I've got quite a bit on the Non-Native Invasive Species Week, uh, which happened here on the Isle of Man, the first. Uh, and the Minister, Geoffrey Boot, was away at the uh, 15th British Irish Council Summit of the Environmental Ministers, uh, which happened in Dublin, uh, just to kick off the uh, week. So uh, we'll be hearing from him. And also the uh, Senior uh, Marine Environment Officer for DEFA, Peter Duncan, about the, the large threat which uh, can come from uh, the marine side of uh, you know the species sneaking in on boats and bilges and things like that. He'll be explaining more about that. And also Richard Selman, who is the Senior Biodiversity Officer and Zoologist for DEFA, uh, he explains more where the threat would come from uh, from birds and also the, the larger uh, side of the wildlife and also from plants too. There's so much been done on the island to preserve all the native species. It would be such a shame now to go and ruin it. So this is a great idea and make it awareness to the general public of how to be a bit more vigilant and protector our lovely island yes that's what's uh, needed isn't it and uh, you do get the odd people who would try and spoil it and sneak things in illegally by the sound of things but um, obviously if everyone is rallying around together uh, to help you know to curb this down before it uh, actually gets a, a bigger problem you know, it's the main thing isn't it it really is it's just taking care isn't it and showing a bit of respect for our island and, and what work has gone into it over the many years mm. and also nice to see through some of the <laughs> the drier areas, uh, the the wildflowers on the island, and you uh, had a, a chat with the people involved in the, the walk around Silverburn in particular. Yeah, recently they had the walks around Silverburn and, and many guided walks over the Easter period, which was great for Manx people. And to have the knowledge of Simon Smart to talk about the Manx wildflowers that are just showing their faces around the hedgerows now, it was a real insight into what a beautiful island we have. Yeah, and it, there's such variation of colours, isn't there? Blues and yellows and everything like that. Um, and the gorse, which is more or less... In, in flower all year round now a lot of it it really does give you that sprinkle of colour when you need it most in mm. the in the winter months and yeah it's it's so nice can't wait for the bluebells to come yeah, out they're my I like favourite the, I like the smell of gorse oh it is nice yeah, it isn't is it nice. alright here's this week's Countryside Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual <laughs> well it's springtime supposedly Kerry here on the Isle of Man some of the wildflowers are unavailable for viewing unless you've got a snorkel and <laughs> goggles. Uh, but it is that time of year where we really have some great wildflowers here around the Isle of Man, isn't it? That's right. The island is finally greening up a little bit and there's some spring winter flowers about. And recently, with the Easter walks getting underway, one of the guides, Simon Smart, took people along Silverburn and I caught up with him to see what was out in flower already. They're coming along very nicely now. It might have been a little bit early for a wildflower walk when we went out, but we did see quite a lot of different things. Some of it maybe not quite as far along as it will be now, yeah. but we saw a few particularly interesting things along the... Silverburn River. One is the butterbur. You might have seen it. It's a very strange looking flower. These little pink tufts a few inches high. They almost don't look like flowers at all. Uh, but later in the year you'll see these enormous broad leaves covering the riverbank there, which is the same plant. Oh wow, so it really does get established and turn into such a, a beautiful item really. Oh yes, yes. And the reason it's called butterbur is because those big leaves they used to use to wrap butter with. And I do believe there is a tale about the daffodil as well. It was very unlucky to bring it into a house in, in the olden days. That's right. The Manx tradition was... When the geese were laying their eggs, you'd bring them inside the house because this time of year it can be quite cold. And the worry was that the geese would see these yellow flowers and think they were goslings and stop hatching the eggs. So oh it's considered my. very unlucky to bring the daffodils in because your geese might not hatch their eggs. And do you see many traditional or native plants to the Isle of Man wild in the hedgerows? Uh, well, the daffodil is a, a native species, of course. And you might have seen the Van Sion variety of daffodil, which has a kind of double trumpet on the inside. That may actually be originally native to the Isle of Man. It's hard to tell exactly, but it was first recorded in England, but it's believed it might actually have originated here. What's your favourite wildflower, Simon? Is there one in particular? Obviously, it's only spring now, throughout the whole of the year. There is actually one in particular for me. It's called bog bean. 
Ooh, very nice. <laughs> it's, uh, the Manx name is quite nice as well. It's Lubba Lub in Manx. Oh. Uh, you'll find it at the Currucks at the right time of year. Unfortunately, it's usually around TT week, so it can be quite hard <laughs> to get up there. It's a very unusual looking plant. The flowers are very exotic looking, is all I can say. They've got little tendrils coming out of them. Definitely worth looking out for. And you can find all this information. Obviously, you have a website and a Facebook page that you keep up to date. And there's photographs there of, of such a plant. Yes, that's right. I have a Facebook page called Wildflowers of the Isle of Man, which I update as often as I can, quite often daily during the summer when there's enough flowers around. And there are always new pictures every year. And I also have a website, manxwildflowers.com, which has a map of the island and a list of what's in flower at the moment. You can see what's growing and where to find it, hopefully. Where is your favourite place on the island for flowers, Simon? That's a difficult question to answer because there's so many different places and so much diversity in what you'll see in each of them. Scarlet has some very interesting things that you won't find anywhere else. Even Port St Mary, where I used to live, is very diverse. You'll see things on Brad Ahead that you won't see anywhere else on the island. It's very hard to pick a particular place. In the north of the island you have the orchids, which you won't see anywhere else. So yeah, I'm very hard pressed to pick somewhere in particular, I'm afraid. <laughs> and do you like getting onto the beaches and the plantations? Is there things that can be found there even? Oh, absolutely, yes. We have a very wide variety of coastal plants which you can find on the beaches, the plantations. The newer plantations, not so much because the pine needles contain a chemical that stops seeds from germinating. But the more established plantations, you'll see a lot of interesting plants on the forest floor, especially the wood sorrel is a very nice one. The little shamrocks oh, yes, with they little are. white flowers they are, when they come up. They can carpet the ground in some places. And do you find that the island is very good for wildflowers? Do we have a kind of different uh, ecosystem to other parts of the world, do you think? I think we do, but I think the Isle of Man's real benefit is that it's got such a variety of ecosystems in such a small place. We've got the coastal plants, we've got the forest plants, we've got plants out on the hillsides. You can cross between ecosystems very, very quickly. You can see different things in a very small space. And do you find there's more newer wildflowers appearing year on year, or are they just very old and traditional? I don't think we get a great deal of newcomers, so to speak, but there are some that you can not see for years and then will suddenly come out. Oh. Um, there's one called a great mullein, which produces hundreds of seeds when it's flowering, and then it can stay dormant for up to 100 years <gasps> without ever coming up above the ground again. And have you ever seen one? Yes, it was a good year for them last year. I hadn't seen them for many years, and then they seem to be everywhere. It's as soon as the ground gets turned over, the seeds germinate, and they'll they'll come up again. And the areas of uh, special scientific interest, in particular, do you find any really really old species amongst these, you know, like Sandton Gorge out on Langness Peninsula? What's interesting is I've read some old books going back from Victorian times, really, and they talk about how the bog bean I mentioned before, for example, used to carpet the ground across parts of the island, whereas now it's quite a rare sight. The reason is the land's been drained for agriculture and so on, uh, whereas there used to be a lot more wetlands for things like that to grow. Some of the flowers are edible. Uh, Foraging for free seems to be a a bit of a a buzzword recently. Do you tend to eat many of your flowers that you find? I'm not a big forager, but I have tried quite a few different things. Gorse is apparently very nice. It's very nutty. I found it's a bit more coconut taste to Ah. get to it, or a little little, little bit of vanilla. Uh, We've actually got two different gorses on the island. There's oh, a, a native gorse and a European gorse, which is a, an import. And are they very different? They're different in terms of the plant. I don't know about the flavour. You'd probably have to ask somebody <laughs> else about that. Uh, but the European gorse is the one that grows very tall and tree-like, whereas the native gorse is very close to the ground. You tend to have a lot of farmland that's uh, bordered with the with the gorse. It is a brilliant shelter for young stock, especially this time of year we've been busy lambing. It is, it's a great shelter belt. Some of these natural plants are, are really, really useful. Yes, I think that's one of the reasons that European gorse was introduced in the first place uh, for hedging. Also, they used to make animal feed out of it. And it's also a nitrogen fixer. So rather than leaving a field fallow, you could plant it with gorse and it would put nutrients back into the soil. So as people are getting out and about, Simon, what are they to look out for in the next few months? Because obviously summer's, spring, summer's only around the corner now. Well, of course, the favourite of the island, or one of my favourites, is the bluebells. Yeah. They will be coming out Definitely. by the end of the month. We will see bluebells everywhere. I've already seen one or two early ones around. Of course, yeah. we've got the wild garlic, which is already... We have the leaves everywhere, but it will be flowering before too long and it will smell even more garlicky than it does already. Uh, We have the spring squill coming up on the coast, little blue flowers you'll see at the Calf Sound. There's a wide variety of other things that are 
a little bit rarer. You might see the marsh marigolds in swampier areas, the big yellow flowers you'll see at Port Sodrick and um, Glen May. It's really just a huge variety. I could keep going on and on about all the different flowers that'll be coming up soon. That was Simon Smart, who runs the website of manxwildflowers.com. He's uh, very enthusiastic and seems to put a lot of work in uh, behind the scenes of it all. That's right, and obviously travelling around the Isle of Man over the years, he's really developed a knowledge for the Manx native species in particular, but he loves getting outside and enjoying the Manx countryside, and this is kind of what the year of our island is trying to do, get people out to explore, and uh, what better way than having a guide like Simon to show us what's nice in the hedgerows. Yeah, and when you walk around um, the island's you know, different um, greenway roads, the railway tracks and all the walks that are available legally to walk on. Um, there is so much variation of colour in, in them wildflowers that all seem to just fit nice together, don't they? And just when you walk and you think, uh, you'd love to pick some, but just just leave them there. That's right, especially along the roads as well, when the pink campions come out and they're just absolutely that vivid pink and then the yellow buttercups amongst them. Oh, I just can't wait for summer now. Do you ever put the buttercups under your chin? Yes, we used to do that at primary yeah. school and make daisy chains, so you take it all for granted, you know, little yeah, living don't things. Don't see kids doing it now, do you? Not so much. <laughs> Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. Well, last month, the Isle of Man took part in the first non-native invasive species week. Well, it all started over in Dublin with a meeting of the British Irish Council, of which our own minister, for DEFA, Geoffrey Boot, attended. It was an opportunity to launch uh, the first ever British Invasive Species Week. And uh, we did that with a little fanfare. British Irish Council covers the UK and the devolved parts of the UK, Northern Ireland, uh, Ireland itself, and uh, the Channel Isles, Scotland, and the Isle of Man. So we, we were taking part in that. It, it seems that um, it, it involved all uh, different areas of the British Isles that can be affected by it. invasive species, I suppose. Yes, well, invasive species, non-native invasive species, don't respect borders. So we all need to be alert. For instance, uh, I found out that the Asian hornets, which kill bee populations, native bee populations, have been found uh, on several occasions in the Channel Isles and they're getting nearer to us, maybe as a result of climate change or maybe they're just uh, increasing their territory. But these are things that we need to look out for. And it's important to remember that invasive species aren't just animals, birds, insects. They cover marine species as well. It's a whole range of things that can cause problems if they arrive on our shores and can destroy potentially our native biodiversity. The Isle of Man, I think, be fair to say, has got a pretty good record in this field over years, hasn't it? Regarding the outbreaks, for instance, of foot and mouth and keeping badgers and foxes and things off the Isle of Man. Pretty good record in that respect. What about the the other parts of the British Isles? Have they had problems? Well, uh, some of the animals you mentioned there are native (laughs) uh, in other parts of the UK. And yes, we have been fortunate in keeping some out. We didn't do quite so well with wallabies, but uh, we won't talk too much about that. (laughs) They're now part of our uh, national ethos, I think. But certainly, yes, we are. And and that also applies to our disease-free status for bees and our farm animals. And uh, we want to maintain that so we need to be ever vigilant that not only as I said early animals and plants but uh, diseases as well can destroy some of our cherished environmental projects and farming practice. Are they worried to the other parts? I think everywhere we, we are worried I mean with greater mobility nowadays boats for instance a lot of leisure boats will move marine species around and with exotic pets becoming more popular and different sorts of plants uh, and plants bring with them diseases within the soil that they've imported in. I think everyone's worried that that, uh, there will be more invasive species and that's why we uh, are part of this uh, invasive species week to bring awareness to people and public generally that uh, some of the practices that they do can result in things that we don't want being brought onto Ireland and uh, being aware that if they are brought onto Ireland we try and eradicate them if we can uh, as soon as possible. Minister for DEFA Geoffrey Boot who attended the 15th British Irish Council Summit of Environmental Ministers in Dublin last month. 
Well, the threat, we always think, is from maybe foxes or badgers that could sneak their way here onto the Isle of Man. But it was made known to me that one of the biggest threats is through the island's waters and the threat to marine life, as the Senior Marine Environmental Officer for DEFA, Peter Duncan, explained. No, it certainly as an island, I, th- I think we're sur- clearly surrounded by, by water um, and the, these other jurisdictions, and so... And one of the major transmission routes is potentially through things like leisure boats, ballast water, even things like marine debris floating onto our shores. And likewise, if we end up with some of these invasive species, then we have a, a, a role to play in trying to limit its spread to these to these other countries surrounding us. Are we talking um, sharks, things like that, or, or all sorts of different uh, marine species? The range of potential invasive non-native species covers everything from from birds to mammals to insects, even even to things like bacteria and viruses, I guess you could you could consider in that way. From a re- marine perspective, the worst ones are are probably uh, things like marine algae or seaweeds, things like sea squirts, which are some jelly-like things. But in particular, there's there's one that we're concerned about, which is the 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 carpet sea squirt, which, as the name suggests, it really it really covers whole structures in this squidgy carpet of, of, of tissue, animal tissue, um, and that really can, can provide a, a, a significant threat to, as you can imagine, to, to local species, uh, but even clean-up costs when it, when it gets into water pumps, when it gets around propellers and intake valves, etc., then um, removing that or cleaning it up. Um, there's an example in, in Wales and that it cost them £800,000 to, to do the clean-up of that particular species. As I said, there's a range. We have on the island, as far as we know, there's around 12 invasive species. At the moment, we don't believe that they're causing terribly much harm, but they have the potential to do that. So in Ramsey, on the piers there, we've had a a programme in the last few years to to monitor and even remove things like Pacific oysters, which shouldn't be here. There's a, a thing called Darwin's Barnacle from Australia and New Zealand, which is established there. And around the island, there's a seaweed called wireweed, which um, is is a bit nasty because it tends, particularly in sheltered areas, to dominate the tidal pools, blocks out light and and takes nutrients from our our native seaweeds, etc. And of course, one of the things that the recent non-native species awareness raising has been about, while these natural, some of these, these events are natural, There are also human activities that move things around. Sometimes it's deliberate, but mostly it's accidental or just not not understanding. So freshwater and marine water users bringing equipment from across and bringing it over to the island really need to make sure that their equipment is dry, that it's clean before they use it in, say, for example, Manx Reservoirs. And last week, uh, uh, one of the lectures that we had was was actually one of our officers talking about... um, the potential threats in freshwater systems because there's there's definitely some nasty potential invaders and they can actually eat quite easily be brought in and soft soft sold waders or in wet equipment landing nets etc so one of the important things that we try and do is raise awareness about about procedures that the public can can stop these things but also monitor them and if they see anything that they should be reporting to defa i've just seen a, a little fly here that's got Check clean and dry on it. Can you tell us a bit more about that one? Well, that's a campaign that um, originated in the UK, and uh, as it sounds, it's a, it's a catchy phrase, which which really is about particularly water sports equipment and recreational equipment. That if you're using it on on, on particularly fresh water bodies and rivers, etc., that when you take your equipment out, then it should be you check it for for that there aren't any. Uh, hitchhikers um, attached to it and, and, and clean it properly and make sure that it's dry because if it's dry then things can't survive and it, it's actually quite remarkable how long certain things can live with just a little bit of moisture so we're thinking about things like quite exotically titled species that we definitely don't want here like zebra mussels or killer shrimp things like that actually are and that's part of the of the problem with them is they're very tolerant to being moved around. And so check, clean, dry is a, a really important message that we're trying to get out. That was Peter Duncan, the Senior Marine Environmental Officer for DEFA. 
Well, to find out more about the threat on the bird and animal front on the island, I spoke to Dr Richard Selman, who's the Senior Biodiversity Officer and Zoologist for DEFA, and he explained where the main threats would come from. Cooperation and coordination that's absolutely necessary in order to, to have an impact and prevent the spread of such species as these into the Isle of Man from our perspective, because some of these are very, very difficult to control, and so our, our main attempt is to try and stop getting here in the first place and to educate people as to what they can do through some of these campaigns that are linked in here, such as the Check Clean Dry, in order to prevent those species getting here in the first place because it can be enormously costly to, to manage such species and, as I say, sometimes impossible to eradicate once they are here. Some people love exotic pets now. They've got a little bit of money to spare. Is that one of the areas where it's a worry? There do seem to be fashions that come and go in the pet world. You know, you see tortoises popular sometimes and less at others. And it can be an issue with regard to some species that can become problematic in the wild, which is where we refer to non-native invasive species. We're really we're referring to those that aren't native here but are also causing us problems, often economic problems, and therefore they've been labelled as, as these um, non-native invasives that we actually need to list and tackle. One that we've seen an issue with uh, through the pet market is people bringing in um, yellow-bellied sliders, for instance, which is a, a terrapin. It's uh, another subspecies related to the red ear terrapin, which have also come across before now. But clearly not being given adequate information or not considering it properly in terms of how to look after this pet in future. So they've kept them in a tank. Of course, they've grown. They've outgrown the tank. And then they've decided they can't look after these things anymore. And they've dumped them on riverbanks or they've dropped them off surreptitiously at the wildlife park, which seems rather unfair on the, <laughs> the park to have to deal with them. So um, we, we've had various reports of these things out there. And these things can, can live for 80 years and, and eat whatever else is in the pond. So you drop them into a pond that's of particular interest and you could have quite an effect on that. So we really don't want to see that sort of thing happening. If people buy a pet, they really need to find out what they're buying. There's an onus on them to learn about their pet before they make their choice, know that they can look after it for the life of it. You know, puppies, puppies not mm. just for Christmas and all that mm. stuff. And definitely not to, to allow these things either to escape or particularly to release them into the wild. You know, if you can't keep something, rehoming is an option, but release into the wild is just not on. It's not just limited to animals and birds and marine species, though, is it? Um, we've had trouble in the past with tree diseases and parasites that side of it is that as big a problem yes um the, the diseases are the, are the ones that have been picked up in the legislation best in the past and so they're the invaders that we're, we're most aware of and on top of and there's a whole range of different legislation in different sectors to do with diseases of bees and trees and plants and all sorts of different things livestock and such like Plants moving around can be quite an issue in itself, and there's a bee plant-wise campaign. If people go onto the um, non-native species secretary or just Google bee plant-wise, they'll see the advice that's in there, and particularly um, focused on some of the, the the really problematic pond plants that you can commonly get from pond plant suppliers. Uh, things like parrot's feather, New Zealand pygmy weed. Um, these are species that we have on the island, and if people move plants from one pond to the other, they only need little pieces of some of these things and can tr transfer the plant. Now, New Zealand pygmy weed can carpet a whole pond and all the banks to the detriment of everything else because it will just completely swamp everything else. In fact, swamp stone crop is one, one of its really? names. It's, it obviously lives in the wetlands, but it also does swamp all the other the other plants and species in there, and it's... it's um, nigh on impossible to get rid of because you, you can rake it out and compost the stuff and remove most of what you can see but little pieces that are left in there will grow back and, and then cover it again so the emphasis again is on preventing it getting in there in the first place so anybody getting pond plants needs to be very aware of where it's coming from so if you're getting some from a neighbor's pond you want to be careful that they don't have one of the species mentioned in bee plant wise or one of the others on, on schedule later the wildlife act so they're not introducing something that's going to be a problem for them in the future and it's the same, to be honest, from nurseries as well. You want to know that those nurseries don't have these plants in what they, you're buying from them. So you may, you may be buying something you really want and you may find you've got an extra little hitchhiker that's in there. Also, Richard, the, the Isle of Man has had a great reputation from people around the world about our bees. Uh, is, is that another issue? Uh, yeah, or potential problem? <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, there's an awful lot of work been done by beekeepers and, and the department with them on uh, trying to protect our, our bees. 
and we'd hate something to come in and, and work against that. And our main worry at the moment is the uh, movements of Asian hornets, which came to France. It was thought through some plant pots which were brought over from, from, from Asia, and there was probably a queen in there that would have established a colony. Um, since then, they've spread right through France, really devastating uh, beekeeping in, in France. Um, I've been pushing at the um, channel, and they've been on uh, Jersey. And there have been three incidents in the UK in really? the last two years, one in Scotland, two in England. They've been tackling the last one down in the southwest of England, and so they're eradicating those as soon as they occur. It could arrive here any day, either through the UK, or it might just hop over, if, you know, again in, in plant pots or something, if a queen comes over. And they will take apart a hive of bees, bee by bee, uh, taking the bees away as, as a meat source. And so it could be very devastating for, for beekeepers. So we really don't want those to arrive. And therefore, we've got a, a response plan, which we've just posted on the gov.im website, um, which states who to contact in case you find something that you believe may be an Asian hornet. Now, we're not talking about the European hornet here. There is a good identification guide for Asian hornets um, online. Um, so anybody that's worried can look at that or they can contact me at the Department of Environment, Food and Agriculture or the bee inspector in, in St John's, Harry Owens. Dr Richard Selman there, the Senior Biodiversity Officer and Zoologist for DEFA, telling us uh, about the main threat uh, here on the Isle of Man in the, the way of birds and also uh, uh, animals. Um, you know, when I think most of it could have been come in by people bringing exotic animals and things but as Richard was saying there a lot of it can be in garden plants that are uh, you know brought over and little things are stuck to the bottom of them and you know they just go from there and also you know people you know here throughout that uh, people maybe have terrapins and they think oh they're growing too big now I'll, I'll just put it out somewhere quiet in the Isle of Man, you know, it'll sort of disappear. <laughs> yet yet they, they can live to sort of 70 years old, so, you know, they, they, wow. they can go into there. So, you know, it's it's not just a, a short-term problem, this. So. No, it's so much unknown, and mm. I, I think it's the educational side of it, you know, making awareness to the public and, you know, everybody at a young age that... You know how beautiful our island is and how to preserve it. Yeah, enough pests here without getting more in, isn't there? Very true. <laughs> Let me just mention something that's happening uh, this Friday evening at the Solby Community Hall. Uh, there's going to be a slideshow presented uh, by Vivian Quain and also Judy Kelly. Uh, this is going to be about the old Solby River. Um, where it started up at Brandywell, you know, runs right down to uh, obviously Ramsey Bay. And they've got a slideshow of uh, what the river was like and where the tributaries and everything went uh, long before the Solby Dam was built up there where it is now. So that'll be very interesting. That's this Friday night, the, the 20th at Solby Community Hall. It starts at 7.30. And don't forget also that Nature's Value Biosphere and Biodiversity in the Isle of Man uh, lecture at the Manx Museum Lecture Theatre. That is starting this Saturday the 21st from 10am in the morning. And there's all sorts of very, very knowledgeable speakers to talk about. Uh, bird research, wallabies and uh, woodlands and seabirds, everything uh, to do with the Isle of Man. So that's a whole day out uh, that you can go to for Manx Wildlife Week here. And uh, that starts at the Manx Museum. Uh, this Saturday the 21st starts at 10 o'clock Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual Well, a sort of good message all around in this week's Countryside uh, protect our environment from non-native invasive species and that in turn will help our beautiful Manx wildflowers to continue uh, to make the island such a beautiful place to walk around. And there is so many great walks, isn't there? The glens, the plantations and the coastal paths. It's time for everybody to get out and really enjoy it, isn't it? Shake it off is. those winter blues. It is. All right, we'll leave it there for this week's Countryside. We're back next week with more. So from me, Simon Clark And me, Kiri Kermode. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all-new Super Superfast Plus Broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. 
For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click shore.com. Love the Terms and conditions apply.